You ready? Ready. Three, two, one, go. We are now recording. Recording Recording live from FYP Studios East and West. Transmitting across the internet, this is episode 58 and a happy new year of Registry Matters. Larry, this is the first episode of the new year and we are back in our separate places and I feel so much more comfortable being here with my equipment and my screens and all that. I just feel better this way. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to be with you for the new year and looking forward to our stellar growth that we're going to have in 2019. That's pretty neat, isn't it? We were just talking about that before the show about um, just the, you know, you didn't think that anything would really come of this when we started. I know we talked about this kind of halfway recently, but I'm pleased. I thought it was the nuttiest thing I'd ever heard. (laughs) I wanted to ask you something. I was listening to something earlier today. And uh, I wanted to get your opinion of it because I'd never considered the thought process this way. When a public defender or any uh, attorney is defending someone, they get accused of of Charles Manson kind of crimes. And that guy still has to have an attorney. And someone comes to them and goes, well, why do you go around defending all these terrible people? And he goes, why don't you ever ask the prosecutor, why are you prosecuting someone knowing that they might be innocent? The inverse of the equation is right then. I was like, Oh yeah, that's a good point. I've never considered that option of why don't prosecutors back off a little bit, considering that they could put someone that's innocent in jail. I think that's a that's an appropriate response. I think uh, I would it, go a little deeper than that. I would I would try to I often try to educate people, and perhaps maybe I get criticized for that. But our system is designed; it's an adversarial system. It's not designed to get to the truth, and. The person who's accused needs to have an advocate because there's a jousting contest taking place. And if that person doesn't have a jouster, they're doomed. Right. So they have to have they have to have representation. Now I would agree that if you find the if the client confesses to you, uh, which is uh, more likely going to be the case, the, the person that's accused is going to usually be guilty of something. If they confess to you and you find their confession to be so objectionable, you can ask the court to be allowed to withdraw for ethical and moral reasons and what what have you. But but when one person asks you how can you defend a person, it would be to me it would be equivalent to asking a doctor how could you how could you walk away from a patient. I mean the the the, the person that's facing the criminal apparatus of the criminal justice system or the state of the federal government. They, if they don't have anybody jousting for them, they're doomed to lose, whether or not they're guilty or innocent. I agreed. I mean, I, but, I mean, it was just the, the point that was being made was about the uh, prosecutors of, of what you just described, though, is it's not about justice. It's about putting notches on your belt. Hey, I defended this guy. I got them the minimum sentence that I could get them. The prosecutor's like, I prosecuted the guy. I got the maximum sentence that I could get them. It doesn't have anything to do with truth or did justice get served? It just had to do whether the two people could debate and whether the jury found them guilty or innocent. That is, well, that's largely correct. The, the, our system, <laughs> people, if they did look at me weird and roll their eyes, and I'm sure they will be when they hear this, but our system is not designed with the specific intent of revealing the truth. It's designed right. to allow adversarial parties to have a, a referee, neutral, uh, 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 a, a neutral referee it's supposed to be, not always is, but a person with neutrality to referee them trying to put on a convincing show. It is not designed to get to the truth. When you start a trial, th- at the end of that trial, it, the, the intent is not to get to the truth of what happened. And, and people, they, they just, they just look. Like, well, <laughs> what is wrong with you? How can you say that? Well, it was designed to give the accuser, the state or the federal government, if it's a federal charge, the opportunity to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Right. That's what that proceeding was about. And the defense attorney is doing everything he or she can to preclude that from coming true because that's their job in the jousting contest is to prevent the side that's, that's trying to stab the heart of the accused from succeeding. We're yeah. not trying to figure out what happened. <laughs> I, I, I get it. I, but I, do you see my point, though, that people don't ever ask that inverted question about the prosecutor? They don't. They, they don't. And I've heard that before. You know, How could you prosecute an innocent person? They do it all the time. Ethically, Obviously. They're, not, they're not allowed to do that. Uh, the, 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 a prosecutor has a higher 
ethical responsibility than does a, a defense attorney as a member of the bar. If you look at the rules of professional conduct, there's a rule specifically for prosecutors, but I don't know how many follow the rules. Uh, the, you know, I've given a shout out to one that I did admire in, in, in Boulder uh, that, 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 that was very ethical and followed those rules. Of course, he didn't stay in office, but he did stay in office for 30 years, but, but he ended up uh, alienating. It was uh, the, uh, 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 he, he lost his uh, job over the uh, job at a Ramsey case because uh, he, he wouldn't, he wouldn't prosecute the Ramseys. And there was a vengeance uh, need in Boulder at the time for someone right. to pay for that little girl's death. And, and uh, uh, we had, we had a, a, a ethical prosecutor that said, I'm sorry, I, the evidence just isn't there. I can't yeah. bring charges against these people. The evidence won't support what we've got. Uh, we can't, we can't do it. And and of course, people said, well, it's only because the family was wealthy. If they hadn't have been wealthy, he would have filed charges. I don't believe that about uh, about uh, that DA uh, or his chief deputy. Uh, I don't believe that that was their, their way of doing business. Um, and then, we, you know, we had that uh, um, that article last week where the guy spent 15 whatever years and got exonerated, couldn't get off probation. That's what the story was about. But, you know, he spent all that time and was eventually uh was freed off of the, the DNA evidence. So there, the prosecutor prosecuted him. Maybe there was sufficient evidence 15 years ago, but still it just like, it's, it feels to me like in those cases where someone gets cleared from DNA evidence, that there may have been something else that could have uh, given them a little bit of doubt going, eh, maybe not, maybe lesser charges, maybe something, but not, you know, and let's not like try and string them up in the in the city square and throw tomatoes at them all day long. A lot of prosecutors know if they can just get a case to the jury, they're going to get a conviction. Because right. They know they know their jurors are not particularly sophisticated. They know their communities well enough to know what type of person is likely going to end up on a jury. And, right. And then they they use their peremptory challenges to make sure that a thinking person doesn't get on the jury. And they end up with uh, with being able to secure conviction on the flimsiest of evidence because emotion comes into it oftentimes. And and when there's been a, a particularly uh, uh, appalling or heinous crime, someone's got to pay for it. And and, yeah. and the police the police wouldn't have brought this person in here if they didn't have pretty good evidence. I mean, the, mm. the, the cops yep. wouldn't bring up for bring an innocent person. That's what an average citizen's going to think. And that and there goes to your the. Fill in the blank are as pure as the wind driven snow, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get moving. We'd like to thank our newest patron, Kirk. And I can't thank you enough. Welcome to the Registry Matters family and long live and prosper. And then also thank you to all of our other patrons. We greatly, 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 greatly appreciate your support in us. A couple little kooks talking on a Saturday night to talk about legal news related to the registry. I don't know how to echo that enough, but it, it is, it is, it is, it is personally touching to think that we're doing something that's valuable enough that that people would donate any amount of money. And we've got some that are donating amazing amounts of money to 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 us. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking about. I mean, I I would never have thought that. I, I just hope I can continue to meet your expectations. I know Andy hopes the same thing that we can continue to meet Absolutely. your expectations of providing something that's useful to you and, and uh we we i actually look forward to, to sitting down on saturday evening i drove back after i went home to have some plumbing work done to, to sit and record that's it not true you do not look forward to this don't lie i, I do look forward to it <laughs> that's, that's why I, I i came i came in and read all your articles it's because of the thousands of dollars that i pay you well i wouldn't go that far <laughs> All but right, well, hoping, we'll stop oozing I'm over hoping, ourselves now. I'm, I'm hoping it gets to that level someday. It would be pretty neat. There, there are podcasts that make a truckload of money. There's one that I know that they make $2,000 an episode. And by no means am I like aspiring to get to that level, but that is phenomenal that they make that much money. Well, my my uh, goal in life was to, to do talk radio. Yep, and I know I, that. And I, uh, for the listeners who, who don't know that, I, I went to broadcasting school in 19... 19- 76 still had hand crank radios and radar o'reilly was there going uh over and talking right it paid money to have uh professionals teach me how to speak and not say get like you say in the south you better get out of here <laughs> and, uh, and then, oh is that where you is that how you lost your accent yeah they would they would actually we would record on cassette tapes 
and and uh, we we would uh, the, the professionals would listen to those later. And if you did a sniff or a cough or anything, didn't didn't yeah. use the cough button. And if you said something that was totally butchered pronunciation wise, they would they would they would remind you that you didn't pronounce something that way. And I had this dream that I was going to do talk radio, but with seventy six, there was very little talk radio being done. Yeah. Uh, there, there was. Uh, it was. It was largely. If you listen to the radio, they were playing music in those days. They might devote a portion of their day to a, a program where they would, they would, uh, they would have callers ca- call in. They would, they would do sound off type things where people would actually give their opinion and they would say thank you for calling. Well, I had this notion that actually I could talk to people and give my opinion, and and station managers told me it was the craziest thing they'd ever heard of. That that uh, that the stations that that their, our, their transmitters would be bombed and that, you know, we can't we can't take positions <laughs> like that and and uh we, you're 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 living in a fantasy world and 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 of course I wasn't there was a station in Atlanta called WRNG Ring Radio that was actually doing talk radio uh, uh, at, at that time but they were the only station they were AM six eighty and they probably had a thousand listeners or something you know it was a small small AM station and, and I had this dream of doing that well I never got to do it because. The jobs that were available to me didn't pay very well in small markets, but it wasn't. I didn't know enough about music. I I, I knew if I liked it, but I, I when when you play music, they expect you to know a little bit about the artist. And, and I didn't know jack about music. Uh, you can I, learn I, that I, stuff, though. You can learn that this is you know Taylor Swift or Miley Cyrus or well, well, Creed yeah, they gave you, they gave you a playlist. Uh, you know, if you were if yeah. you were on the station, the format you couldn't go outside the format, so you had a pr- playlist and you would take phone calls and pretend like you were playing requests as long as it fit within the format uh-huh. the latitude. But I didn't have, that was not exciting to me. I didn't yeah, want to do I that. understand. And so so I, I left that and I said, well, someday I might be able to talk to people. Well, I do a little <laughs> bit of that with, with Darcel and I do a little bit on the podcast. And that's the yep. part I look forward to is actually just sitting and talking because I love to talk to people. And this gives you an opportunity to, as you like to say, pontificate on the issues that are re- relevant to our people. I spent my life uh, reading and becoming informed and studying about issues and understanding systems. And this gives me an opportunity to share that knowledge with those who want to know how things work and why they work that way. I don't know a darn thing about music. Uh, I mean, I know, like I said, I know what I like, but I, 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 I couldn't sit and be a DJ if they have such a thing these days anymore. I think most people get their music through other sources. Does anybody listen There's... to even FM anymore? No. I, I was uh, with somebody recently, and they had satellite radio, and they still have DJs on satellite radio. Yeah, there are still DJs out there. And oh. yeah, some people still do listen to terrestrial radio. I would say a lot of people still do. But regular commercial. I, I know <coughs> AM is all, all, all pretty much gone to talk radio. The, the AM yeah. stations are not playing music anymore. But does anybody listen to music on FM like we used to Absolutely. do? Absolutely. Yeah, there's still terrestrial radio, and people still listen to you know like the local you know middle Georgia stations and whatnot. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, I don't know I don't, why, but <laughs> so terrestrial radio is the, is the regular radio FM station. Yeah, yeah. That that's, that's the term because it's the opposite of satellite radio or streaming radio. So you would have terrestrial radio. Okay, so the biggie, the biggie in my day in Atlanta was Z ninety three on okay. the FM side, and and and, and, and AM seven ninety WQXI Quixie. Uh, they, those were the dominant players in in the day. All right, and now that we've bored everyone to death, oh, this first article. Bored. <laughs> we've got a lot of we've got a lot of old geezers out there that, that 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 used to listen to radio. Yes, I know. Well, I'm trying to cater to the young guys. That's what we're doing. But this article is is basically talking about uh, in Missouri with their um, civil commitment stuff. It's from the Daily Journal online, and the title is "Fooling the Taxpayer." And I, I thought what was interesting in this article is that they said if these men are so violent and so unrehabilitatable. Then why don't the the it says the majority of the staff is young females, and unlike prisons, there's no doors to separate the staff from the the quote unquote predators, and but there have I think it says there have been none, but then it also goes that like there have been very few actual reports of any sort of sexual assault against the staff. I think that's an interesting point to make about if you've got these people locked up because they can't be let back into society for safety reasons, then why isn't the staff like they're in bulletproof vests and you know behind all kinds of glass and, and so forth to keep themselves safe. But it doesn't appear that they're that way. This uh, civil commitment, specific civil commitment for sexual offenders is so bogus and so wrong. 
from a moral standpoint that it, it, it's just it's just appalling that it's done it, it, it if a person is mentally ill we have civil commitment processes to commit people that are a danger and the reason why they can't use those processes there's actually a couple of reasons one is the regular hospitals don't want the sex offenders in there for what they perceive as liability reasons but the the biggest reason is they're not mentally ill this is not being this is not a commitment because of mental illness this is a commitment because you don't like what they've done and they've served all their time and it's a way of extending their incarceration and disguising it and put enough lipstick on the pig to make it appear <laughs> as though they're getting a little bit of treatment so so in some cases i've gotten reports from people who say there's virtually no difference in the federal system there they say they're staying in the same prison wearing the same uh garb uh right. having the same deprivations of liberty and it's being disguised as civil commitment but in some instances they are putting in, in uh, slightly softer facilities that are more like hospital settings and allowed to wear their own clothing having more access to telephones and stuff but that doesn't change the fact it's bogus and it's, it's wrong. massively expensive it's uh, it's it's expensive if you apply any component of treatment to it. If you just simply extend the person's term in the same federal prison that they're in, I can't imagine that would cost a whole lot more than what it was costing to, to incarcerate them, which is plenty in of itself. But but this is this is so bogus. If they've got a mental disorder, then you should have treated them in the mental health system rather than incarcerating them. That's what makes it so bogus. Oh, and interestingly, I didn't read who the author was, but the author is a former sex offender and has been fighting his own civil commitment in court since 2011. I didn't realize that. I didn't even read that either, but age 70 is a former yeah. who's been fighting. Because, you know, he's going to go out and find some 14-year-old to go perv on, and, uh, you know, she's going to be turned on by the 70-year-old. Right. Well, well, it's, 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 the, the, the problem is it's not unconstitutional. It's it, that's what our listeners have to yeah. understand. If you can put enough lipstick on a pig and make <laughs> it appear as though it's treatment, does there's some component of therapy involved? And you can draft legislation that's vague enough to so that what they what they say is rather than saying a diagnosable mental disorder that would be, I think the DSM-5 is where they are now that they're operating yes. on. I don't think there's a six. But rather than requiring that, they could never meet that standard. They say a mental abnormality. Right, 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 right. To make it all vague and, to where they could put anything in there. And, 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 then, and then they put the burden of, of proof pretty low. And, and, and the sex offender has been incarcerated for years in many cases. And they have no money to fight with, and, and, and they they end up they end up in this lopsided jousting contest where the state wins, mm -hmm. and they they com they com they succeed in committing them, and it, it's it's appalling. But you people yeah. in Missouri, you need to change your law because the courts can't save you from bad public policy. I think you call them roving tribunals. <laughs> well, then moving on, the next article comes from my San Antonio, and it is about a a criminal justice system in Lubbock, Texas, and how they treat their indigent defense. There's a, I guess it almost like a public private partnership that hires defense attorneys and they go in there and they are able to defend their people significantly better than the public defender's office in other counties. And I think it says they do it for significantly cheaper money and with a whole lot of better results. So why doesn't everybody do this? Well, it's the first I've heard of it, so I don't. I read the article and I, I came away from it saying, "Gee, I'd like to know more about it." Uh, it, it it leaves a lot of questions more than answers here. It 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 seems to compare Lubbock with the county that they rest in, which looks like uh, Bexar County. Yeah, and they say that Bexar is 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 bad, but Lubbock is good, and. Right. Uh, and most places would be deeply conservative, and, and apparently they've been able to form a system that addresses many of the deficiencies. And they 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 admit that it might not be transfer very well to to a very urban. Like you couldn't necessarily make what's working in Lubbock work in Houston, but it is an interesting model of 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 of, of providing indigent defense. Um, I I just don't know enough about it, but it seems like that that everybody who was analyzing it is saying they're satisfied. Right. It still seems to me like our system is designed to 
and I don't want to say designed because we, you know, we covered like the system is designed against LGBTQ last week, but it, it feels like it's just stacked to put you in the cage and it's not, we, you know, we could spend more money on the public defender system. We could spend more money on that side of things, spending the same amount of money, but deferring people from going into the box, you lose tax revenue, people, families are split up, et cetera. It could be a more wholesome model. I don't know what the right word is. Well, you're spending, you're spending uh, any money you spend, I should say, is not money that re- receives a lot of taxpayer support when you're, t- when you're trying to go through the critical processes to get funds a- appropriate for energy defense. This is one that's very tough sell. And I don't care whether you're in a liberal or conservative jurisdiction. It's those dollars are very grudgingly handed out. Right. <laughs> it's it, it's like, yeah, we have to. What's the yeah? You mean we, we got to feed by? those people too? Uh, and, and what's the minimum we can get by with doing? And and uh, we, we you end up with uh, contract rates like in Wisconsin that are forty dollars an hour for for mm-hmm. court work, and uh, those are rates from the nineteen seventies. <laughs> that they're that they're paying. So this model here in Lubbock, I would certainly like to know more about it, and we could explore it on a future uh, session after I understand it better. But it seems like the editorial is uh, is, is is very flattering in terms of, of 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 what they've decided to do over in Lubbock. Very good. Um. Over in uh, Florida, we always know we always hear about the tent cities and so forth. And uh, there's another article coming out of Florida today. The title is Not All Sex Offenders Are the Same. It's Time We Reform How We Treat Them. It's an opinion piece from an individual named Marshall Frank. And, you know, here we are again. There's there's a there's another tent city that I guess the people from the um, like the um, industrial area, they got kicked out. So I don't know if these are the same people, but it seems to be something similar. (coughs) And uh, so they found some bridge that they can live under, which has got to be really shitty because, you know, cars are traveling over that bridge all the time. There would be no quiet anytime, 24 hours a day for these people. There would always be cars and trucks and all that stuff slamming over your head all the time. It would suck. Um, but these people, you know, we, we've – okay, you did the bad thing. Great. You get your punishment. Hey, now you're out. Oh, we're going to saddle you with so many balls and chains and so much baggage. You can do nothing. They profile an individual. Uh, I think he committed a crime. He was 19, did his time, and now he's just going to spend the rest of his life and he's not going to be able to get a job and all this stuff. Why, why would we do that to youngsters? And why would we do it to anybody? But there we go, you know, talking about a kid who they just, their whole life is just flushed down the toilet because they had sex with their sophomore girlfriend at a high school, maybe. I don't know why you don't understand that. We cannot, have, <laughs> we cannot have sexual relations taking place with people that are not exactly the same age. So a 19-year-old or not to be having sex with a 15 or 16-year-old. And I don't know why you can't understand that. And he needs to suffer for the rest of his life so he can think really hard and long about what he did. What is so hard about that to understand? And I, you know, I, I have a hard time believing this. these two numbers. It says the age with the greatest number of offenders is 14. I really, I, I got to find how that number is actually presented because I can't imagine that 14 year olds are the highest. I mean, I guess if you spread it out all the way from 14 or 10, whatever, all the way to a hundred, it's the number that has the most people stacked in that one group. But that still seems like a lot of people. And then 23% of all offenders are under age 18. Come on, man. Well, that sounds plausible. The one about the uh, the age of it being 14, uh, perhaps there's a lot of experimentation going on. So stuff that we would never have been charged for in our day. Uh, mm. Adults would say, you ought not be doing that, and that's inappropriate, and you'd get grounded if there's any such term. As, does anybody get grounded anymore? Uh, I know that my kid does. Okay, so that, that's not so far <laughs> out of date. If I were to say grounded around a teenager, that, they would know what I'm talking about. Perhaps maybe maybe time out, maybe uh, turn off your screens or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but but I would suspect that a lot of experimentation that we got away with probably is being prosecuted today. That because we we're 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 just super sensitive to anything sexual. All the stuff that people did streaking back in the seventies, mm-hmm. which you could probably go on YouTube and find uh, find find 
you can find current videos. You could go watch like European uh, soccer games and somebody just wants to be a jackass and they want to interrupt the game and they just go run across the field naked and watch the people chase after them. Well, I don't think anything happens they, out of that. They, they they wouldn't have done anything to you in this country. But yeah, now, I mean, maybe get a misdemeanor that, or whatever. You, yeah. Yeah, now that's a major offense that'll put you on the sex offender registry. Because yeah, cause they, not 50% of the population doesn't have junk like what the person is carrying around the way that they're streaking. Right. It, and and a 14-year-old 14, no 14 year experimenting back in my day would have just been taken care of in-house. A school yeah. that had something like that happen, all that stuff would be happening within, within the school, the disciplinary process. But now everything gets returned turned to law enforcement. There's a demand that everything everything has to be reported. Everything has to, you know, all these reporting rules we have, mandatory yeah. reporting. Everything has to be reported. If somebody does anything, has to be reported. Right. So I, um, and it's a little the, bit surprising, uh, though. Yeah. Right. And the author of the article, interestingly, is a retired police captain at a Miami Dade, which is that's the place where the whole Ron Book shenanigans thing is going on. Uh, it says uh, Marshall Frank, a retired police captain. He's not exactly a beat officer either. Right, right. He's a HMFIC, as it were. What is that? <laughs> um, head, mother, okay, in charge. In charge. Yeah, right. <laughs> I thought I that self believed. <laughs> what do you think about Reason Magazine? Uh, I don't have much to thought one way or the other. Why? Oh, really? I I, en- I enjoy the magazine. They they do present a very interesting <clears throat> counterpoint to the to the left and the right. Uh, arguments that go around and the article that we came across is the number of men in federal prison for viewing or sharing child porn has nearly septupled since 2004. That probably comes from the ease of acquiring it because of this crazy thing called the internet. And it, you know, it'll never make it. It's just a fad. Uh, and then also with the availability of digital cameras just on your phone or, you know, all the high quality gear. So now you have easy production and you have easy distribution and then I guess in law enforcement can easily track it. But now I'm thinking about it. I remember something in the article that talked about that law enforcement can easily monitor the child porn websites and then they know when you hit it. So then they come and get you. But it wouldn't it make more sense to go get the source instead of I mean, you know, go prosecute drug dealers, not drug users. It sounds like the same argument there. Well, first of all, before I get, get, get into that, uh, for those that, like me that don't know what septuple means, can you tell us what that what that <laughs> translates out into? I'm I'm pretty sure that's a sevenfold. Okay, so so sevenfold. Okay, sextuple right, well, would be six, and then sept is uh, seven. Octuple would be, and then you know, octogenarian. Those are the eighty year olds. Okay, so in in a in a fourteen year period, we've got it's seven times seven. As many people. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well. I don't know if I completely agree with you about the, the, the pushers because the pushers respond to demand. And right. those of you who believe in capitalism at its finest, the way you stop supply is you curtail demand. Sure. The, Mexico wouldn't be sending so many drugs to the United States if there was no demand for it. Mexico doesn't cause the demand. It's I Americans completely agree. Get, get, get high uh, yes. that, that causes the demand. And, and uh, so therefore, if you don't deal with the demand, I don't know how you will ever stop the supply. I completely agree with that. Uh, but in terms of this, th- these 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 sentences are horrendous. They're so disproportionate to the criminality of what they're handing out. The amount of time, and they do some comparisons in the article. Congress is mandated for federal. Uh, there's a minimum five years, which is sixty months. Right. Uh, and you and you you're often going to get seventy to a hundred months in the federal system. And of course, I know in some state systems you can get. Longer than that, I get it, but in a lot of yeah, states yeah. like ours, you can't get anywhere near that much time for 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 porn if you're uh, under state law. But these they make comparisons about uh, about robbery the, uh, in t- fiscal 2016. The average sentence received for federal child porn- pornography offenders, 95 percent of whom were not convicted of contact crimes, was 101 months, right. which is nearly as long as the average for robbery. So you can take a gun. Go into the mm-hmm. bank, the, your local branch, take every dime they've got, and you'll get just as much time for staying in the privacy of your home and looking at clicking your mouse. Yep. Something's wrong. Something's wrong with you people out there. Yeah. And the, <laughs> and and the maximum a, sentence is twenty years versus arson, which would be twenty years. Yeah. So you could 
you, you the, we can you if can we want torch somebody's really, place. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can you can burn something down, and uh, it would have to be a federal uh, to, a federal jurisdiction. There would have to be some federal connection. Yeah. But if you could you can torch something that has a federal connection, and and if they max you out. They can't give you any more time than they can give a person who looked at porn. Of course, the the, the reactionary uh, would say, "Well, we need to increase the, the sentence for arson." I think twenty years is plenty for for for, for most arson. I mean, we'd have to look if there was any deaths, which would up it to to, to 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 something beyond arson. But twenty years is enough time to get to get their attention. But these sentences are so disproportionate. And that's not us sitting here saying that looking at child porn is okay. Of course not, but still be some that out there say that that's what we're doing. But we're saying that the the, the punishment is grossly disproportionate. I, I I know that this is insensitive for me to say this, but if you in a isolated environment click on a picture and you see, you know, whatever you see, I have a hard time dealing with the the victims advocates that say you've re-victimized the persons. And I don't like if you came in contact with them and then you could shame them or, or somehow deal with that, then that would be a different. But if you in isolation, see it and then move on, I don't see how that re-victimizes anybody. I've struggled with that myself. I, I, most of the time, I don't think they ever identify who the, who the people are. Right. Maybe I'm missing something, but usually they don't identify. They're not identifiable. In the right. case where they're identifiable, I would suppose that if, if that were being re-shown, there would be, but how would you even know about it? How, if it if it were out there, and one of three hundred thirty million people looked at it, how would you know? How do you even know it's from one of the three hundred thirty three million people? It could be one of the seven billion people. Well, it could be, but the would, U.S. wouldn't be prosecuting you for that. So let's assume it was a, for the U.S. to be prosecuting it was somebody within the United States. But still, it's one of three hundred thirty million people. How would you know? Wait a minute. If you get porn from Russia. And it ends up on your computer, you're not going to get prosecuted for being Russian child porn? Oh, I was saying if the victim is within the United States, if it's an American child, and the prosecution was able to identify that child, they would not be, they would not likely have jurisdiction over someone who was viewing that child in Russia, because Russia would have to agree to hand them over to the United States. So they're mostly going to be prosecuting Americans. No, I'm I'm saying that the other way. If the source of it was from another country, and you're looking at here in our borders, right? It could be one of seven billion. Yes. Yeah. 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 They, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, but 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 they 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 that they would be even less likely. They would know that that an American, if they were if they were not in America, they would never right. have any contact with. I mean, I I don't know how it would it would shame or do that. I I guess I'm just not sensitive enough to understand it. Yeah, we're both a bunch of old crotchety assholes. So, well, how, we're just about, <laughs> yeah, that's us. We're we're not we're not in favor of the victims' advocates. <laughs> I think that's been pretty uh, clear from my <laughs> yeah, probably, podcast. probably. Um, and then this next one from NBCNews.com. He lures alleged child predators and shames them on Facebook. Now one of his targets is dead. This is we've we've had I don't know a hand like a, I don't know half dozen of articles about vigilantes. Over the uh, past year and a half of the podcast, and here we are again. Here's some guy named "quote unquote" incognito. Shane Erdman is uh, that's his real name, and him and his buddies they go on to various different like dating websites. I think they said Grinder and Tinder, and then they post underage profiles or something like that. Anyway, they, however they are enticing their their victims, and they get them to come to an aban- to a, a house that. One of their supporters volunteers the house for them to to pimp out the house, so to speak. And when the person shows up, they fire up the cameras and start asking the person question. And then, you know, they end up on on Facebook. So that happened to one person and uh, he killed himself. Yeah, it would be the way the article described it. It would be those who watch to catch a predator. It would be a, yeah. it would be a, it would be a, a it would be staged largely the same way they did that. Now this the person that they shamed. I just I just want to tell you where this has the, this has dropped through the bottom of the barrel. The person who 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 is dead was named Elaine Malcolm, twenty years old. Malcolm was a handsome, the oldest son of a Jamaican immigrant, which implies he was here legally. He wholly subscribed to the idea of the American dream. In high school, Malcolm was vice president of the Future Business Leaders of America Club. 
assistant captain of the tennis and swim teams, and a member of the student council and model United Nations. He started a marketing business at age 15. This is somebody who had a future ahead of him. After graduating from 2016, in 2016, he got interested in apparently social media. And his, his, his uh, uh, I guess his biggest hangup was that he was gay. And in a small town like Torrington, Connecticut, I would imagine that the gay population would be, would be very small. And he was, he was Jamaican, which tends to be conservative in their, their view of sexuality. And he was a Jehovah Witness, is a Jehovah Witness. And, uh, so it put him in a, in a very bad position. So grinder and those type of things would be where a person like him would go to meet someone. Right. And, 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 uh, he apparently showed up to meet what he thought was, I believe it said 14 or 15 year old. Yeah. Uh, it says, uh, purportedly a 14 year old boy going on 15. So, but what they don't say is if, whether they, they had agreed to have sex, there's right. absolutely nothing wrong with a 20 year old meeting a 14 year old. If there's no sinister uh, motivation, we don't know. Maybe what he was going to mentor him. We don't know that. <laughs> right. we, see, this is where people assume the worst about somebody. Now, generally, I do think people that are on Grinder are looking for hookups. As I understand, I've never been on there, but I've talked to people who have. I think that's why they're on Grinder is, is they're looking for a hookup. And that, as far as I know, for old old people, hookup is when you get together for 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 a <laughs> um, sexual liaison of some type. Um, no string sex. I think that's what a hookup is. But but this 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 is is I hate to say it, but it's where it begs for a prosecution of some type. If there's something that they can find uh, to prosecute to, to to try to stop this this activity, because this is this is way over the top. We've got a 20 year old dead, and we've got vigilantes out there shaming people. Do you think that any prosecutor will pick it up? Probably not, but I'm hoping so. I, I'm trying. I don't know what it. Would this I mean, be you, a um a Judge Persky kind of thing if a DA tried to pick it up that that person would be just like the phone would ring off the hook of the citizens going no man you shouldn't mess with that guy he did us the right thing that's exactly what I'm be afraid of and, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing Torrington is probably a conservative part of Connecticut it doesn't sound like Hartford or any of the major cities um, it doesn't sound like Bridgeport it doesn't sound like Stamford it sounds, it sounds like like it there would be well, like it could be rural Connecticut yeah. But just, you know, um, to, to kind of bring it back around, we often talk about how many of our people are calling the sheriff or the senators or the, you know, whatever, to tell them to not support or support a bill that's in our favor. And, you know, our people don't go in numbers, but here we go. If this person got prosecuted for being a vigilante, the phone will be ringing off the hook telling that DA to back off. Well, that, that would be one thing that would happen. Another thing is that people be donating money for his defense. That's right. what happens oh. every time. There's a, every time there's a vigilante action, money magically. There's all these ways of raising money. What is it called? Uh, uh, GoFundMe. Go, GoFundMe. That's one. Yes. Uh, they, they open up these GoFundMe, and, and people go fund them. Right. So Erdogan would have plenty of money to defend himself with. Right. Mm. And it, he's, it's almost he's, like there should be some sort of campaign finance things to equalize the playing field. You can only have so much money donated from from black sources. Oh. <laughs> Well, he's he's saving the world from pervs. Yes, is, one one perv at a time. This is a long article, but I encourage people to read it. it, it yeah, it, it is a long article. And and, uh, and I mean, I know to to like the the restorative justice to all that. You could take this individual and without shaming him, you could have introduced him to some sort of counseling, to some sort of you know diversionary tactics, and not lost what would potentially be a prosperous. Uh, you know, tax producing, income earning, you know, a, a, a good person that you might think otherwise. So they made one mistake and now you flush the whole thing entirely, including life down the toilet. Well, it reminds me of that young man that got filmed having gay sex in his dorm room in some school up in New England just a few years ago. And he ended up committing suicide uh, after okay. he got shamed. Yep. You, you remember right. that one? I, I do vaguely, but there have been a number of shamings of coming out of the closet and a, a bunch of people have committed suicide in the last, you know, five or 10 years since it's been more acceptable for people to come out. And then, you know, there's still a certain portion of the population that doesn't accept it. It's a good long read. I would encourage people to read the article and perhaps through people understanding how gross this is, we could push back on, on this type of vigilantism is what I'm going to call it. Yeah. Well, um, and then. 
<laughs> this one's totally a setup, though. Do you think that the United States should be able to ban entry from another nation if it so chooses? I think that's what our president has said. That, uh, well, in fact, he put a ban of, of some sort into effect and, and had pushback from people. And the courts have ultimately said he can do that limited travel ban. But I think a nation certainly can ban people from coming into its borders. Yes. And uh, so what we're talking about is in the Philippines, an article came by that says 187 foreign sex offenders, mostly Americans, barred from entering the Philippines in 2017. And I say, well, they're a sovereign nation. They can do what they want. Um, I mean, I don't think they necessarily should be banned depending on what their crime was. You know, if they got charged with sex trafficking, then, yeah, maybe you don't want them in there and depending on what the crime was, whatever. But that's their prerogative to do it. And I know that you want to throw in your little uh, two cents on that concept. I do, because it's an opportunity to remind people that that's exactly what was supported in 2016 when we had candidate Trump. He, he's talked about extreme vetting and keeping out the bad home race, as he referred to them. Uh, well, I hate to break it to you, but nations have the right to view people convicted of sex offenses as bad home race. And <laughs> Bad what the hell's so huh? funny? That was so, bad so funny about that. Bad yeah, hamburgers. Did, did, All right, well, man. I'm just saying what, what the president <laughs> said. Says, says, that's a bad hamburger. So, I know he mispronounced that, it. He he misspelled it, right? Well, I'm just, I just I think that's why he pronounced it. He did. So, he, uh, he called him bad hombre. He called him bad um, hombres <laughs> or hombres. I forget which one it is. Anyway, one of those but, is hamburgers. It's so funny. But, but but if if a nation wants to view people who have sexual offense convictions that's bad i think that nation has the right to do that and they have the right to vet people and i'm surprised that any of our supporters would see otherwise because that's exactly what we do when you when we admit people in this country they are extreme vetted you don't just walk into the united states legally now people do sneak in illegally but to come into the united states legally you go through a significant amount of vetting uh, you know, John and, Oliver, uh, he did a segment on the uh, immigration process, and he said there are 13 agencies before the whole travel ban, before all that came into effect. There are 13 agencies that vet your application to come into the country. Absolutely. It's, it's an extreme process that we put people through. To, to get it's not around. that and people not, just show up on the borders and we let them in. That that like the whole concept from from the conservative side of saying we need extreme vetting. The vetting's already there. But I'm surprised that anybody would be appalled that another nation would want to vet people that enter their borders. Absolutely. I what, agree. What what would be so shocking about that? Do only do only Americans want to keep themselves safe from those who might be bad? I mean I, I think the answer there's obvious, right? What I mean, do do, do other nations do the Filipinos uh, want to keep their children safe? No, because they're not considered as they're not as uh as exceptional as we are. Uh, but I, I I, I don't know that it's the best policy when you just – just merely being on the registry right. is enough to exclude a person, but that is certainly their prerogative to do that. The U.S. and Canada and Australia, a lot of nations exclude people who have convictions of any type. It, it, yeah, it should I mean, shock. It should be like, such like, a shock. Right. I mean Canada, if you have any felony, I'm pretty sure you are not going to Canada. Forget what forget is, what the crime was. If you if probably not dope now, but if you have any sort of domestic abuse, if you have uh, any what anything that's a felony, I don't think you're getting into Canada. Well, you could have misdemeanors to keep you out of Canada, but that's their prerogative, right? I mean, right, as, right, as right. President Trump says, every nation should be have uh, not only the, the the right but the duty to 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 protect their citizens and control their borders. I don't know that right. our listeners would disagree with that. Yeah, the Philippines that they are a nation, right? I'm pretty sure. Actually, you know what? Someone while I was down said that the Philippines was a state, but that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> <laughs> so Cuba, uh, Cuba like was that, also on that list, but that's again, that's another conversation. But I, I, I'm not sure that I can be supportive of the policies in terms of it being a, a policy. But I, but we're talking sure. about whether they have the right to do it. Yeah, uh, you're and, not you're not that, talking about the world that should be. You're talking about the world that is be. Uh, that's correct, and I think they have the right to do that. It may be misguided, but I think they have the right to do that. Ready to be a part of Registry Matters? Get links at registrymatters.co. If you need to be all discreet about it, contact them by email 
registrymatterscast at gmail.com. You can call or text a ransom message to 747-227-4477. Want to support Registry Matters on a monthly basis? Head to patreon.com slash registrymatters. Not ready to become a patron? Give a five-star review at Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Or tell your buddies at your treatment class about the podcast. We want to send out a big heartfelt support for those on the registry. Keep fighting. Without you, we can't succeed. You make it possible. And then there's an article at a Madison, uh, it's called the MadisonRecord.com. Bellevue man sues state's attorney official for $10 million over sex offender registration. You talk about this all the time of we need more litigation. And I think this uh, speaks directly to that idea. He is suing um, state officials for $5 million in compensation dam- compensatory damages and $5 million in punitive damages, alleging his reputation within his community continues to be irreparably injured by his registration status. That sounds effing awesome. I would actually love to see the complaint. I didn't see a link to it here. I'd like to see what he's actually asserting in his complaint. No, I don't see that either. But uh, I intend to actually follow up with our people in Illinois and see if they know this is Illinois. Oh, it is? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I think it said Illinois, but uh, I intend to follow up and see if we can get some information on this because it may be something that's an organization we would like to be involved in. It's an uphill battle to get sure to get to get damages uh, from a governmental entity, particularly if he pled guilty to a crime, which it says he did. His argument is that that they broke the deal and that he agreed to be harmed for a certain period of time, and that he's he's kept his part of the agreement. He served the time, and, and and but they've they've not kept theirs. They're harming him beyond the time that they agreed to. So therefore, I'm he's ass- damaged. assuming he got sentenced before AWA and then got dragged back in after that. I'm just going to assume. Well, yes, that looks uh, like, it looks like it looks like they enhanced his registry requirements, extended right. it. Okay. So doesn't um, doesn't that like literally mean they aren't not holding up his end of the bargain that that would i'm i'm for it i think he says uh, kitterman claims that the state's attorney's office concealed a january 1996 amendment to the illinois child sex offender registry which increased duties and penalties kitterman claims he would not have entered into a plea agreement with the state's attorneys if he had known about the amendment i'm not sure i agree with them on that was the state's attorney's job that's his jouster's job to, to know what right doing. right right but if the state's attorney knew I think they would have had an ethical duty to disclose that, but but he he's he's saying that that he would not have agreed to a lifetime of 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 this, and they changed their part of the deal, which I like that argument. That's uh, interesting. Uh, in 2012, Kitterman alleges he discovered that the contract they entered into was premised on fraud, deception, and unconscionable, and immediately attempted to protect his rights by enforcing the terms of the contract as they existed. Right. So, that's interesting. I, but even even in the current state, after you've done your time by continuing to register, by all the other garbage that they throw on you with the website and the restrictions and so forth, isn't – it's to a lesser degree than this guy had like the breach of contract. However, he's also saying that there's the defamation of uh, uh, irreparably injuring his, uh, his character. I, 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 aren't all the people in the registry dealing with that too? At least like, maybe some of the less – uh, reported states like the New England ones that don't throw everybody up on the website. Well, his his the state's going to argue that his conviction is what hurts his character, not the registry. I don't agree with that. That's what they're going to argue in the, in the sure. rejection. They're going to say sure. that the fact of the matter is you pled guilty to a sex crime, and it's the sex crime that hurts your reputation, not the registry. His argument is, if I didn't have to be on this damn registry. My reputation wouldn't continue to be in the crapper because people would consider me for all sorts of things that they won't consider me for because I'm on this damn registry. Right. I happen to agree with him, but I think is it one dis- a- demonstrable though? Is it what? Isn't it demonstrable that he's being harmed? I mean, you could literally like you know. So when you're when you're trying to collect foods or unemployment, you have to continue to go out and, and say that you're trying to get a job. It's demonstrable that you are or are not trying to get a job. So this guy can go to places and then get denial letters saying, "Hey, sorry, you're on the registry. We can't get you this job." He has 
like a a factual track record, a paper trail of saying my reputation is harmed here. The housing, uh, whatever, the uh, homeless owners association in my neighborhood, they won't let me live there. They're kicking me out or something because, you know, he has all these things that can go in his favor to say I'm being harmed by this. Got all those things, but they will turn back and say you've got a conviction history and that's what's harming you. People don't like you because you have a, you have a conviction that, that, that they they will argue that. Defending the and, lawsuit. And, and I'm not arguing with you, but you take somebody who got convicted of any other crime that doesn't have all this baggage behind it, and they're able to live in the neighborhood. They're able to move on and get all these other jobs. It's because of this whole registration scheme, depending on the scale of it in the various states, that that is then the harm. Absolutely. And like I say, I agree with, with yeah, I know. that he's being harmed. I know. But I think that, that knowing what I know, how the states will defend it, they will claim that, it, that it's not the registry causing the harm. And the burden's yeah. on him to prove. Not the burden's not on the state. He's making the accusation. He's claiming sure. that he's being harmed. He's got to. He's got to prove that. I assume this is civil, correct? Yes. Okay. He's got to prove it Thanks. by preponderance of the evidence. And not, and that's not beyond a reasonable doubt, correct? It's it's much lower threshold, fifty percent plus a little bit. Okay, that doesn't sound hard. <laughs> Except for nobody wants to hear it. Yeah. If you take it to a jury, how many how many jurors do you think want to award damages against their, themselves, which is what they would be? That this is against uh, the, the taxpayers going to have to cough this up. Can you picture jurors sitting there saying, "Oh yes, I'd like to." I know ten million. Yes, I'd like to do that against us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm with it's you. Tough. It's it's, it's <sighs> tough to get those damage awards. Moving right along. I love this one. I just got this one today, so it's a uh, hot off the press. It was uh, published today, January fourth. And uh, <laughs> government shutdown. Federal inmates feast on Cornish hens steak as prison guards labor without pay. I, seriously, like every other day of the week, the guards are getting paid, and and f- federal inmates, I you know they eat they eat better than state ones, but I don't think they're eating like super duper well. So this is a this is a whole lot of misrepresentation about how the uh, prison food system works, and they show, there's a whole bunch of pictures in the article of razor wire and and high guard towers and all this stuff, and then there's a picture of the state capitol being shut down. <sighs> well, to to me, this is a bunch of hooey, and it, it, you have one or two days a year where correctional facilities show a softer side of themselves and they provide better food, a slightly more relaxed atmosphere, slightly more privileges. Uh, you might get a little more extra time with your visitation. They might not do, do as, they might not do as thorough of a strip search. You get fed a little bit better. And uh, to, 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 to find that this is an objection to the government shutdown, I can assure you the inmates don't have anything to do with it. That's true. That the, the, they're in prison. They did not have anything to do with shutdown. It's they not probably their weren't fault. even around to vote anywhere to, to, it, to elect it, any it, of the politicians it, that shut it down. <laughs> it's not their fault that people are in this predicament. So, uh, according to the way I read this article, was that that the prisons should have just arbitrarily said because we're in a government shutdown that we should not give the extra good meal that you get once or twice a year on Thanksgiving and Christmas or maybe Easter. I haven't been in prison, but but you get, get a few days a year where you get a little bit special food. They should have pulled that and fed them like they do the rest <laughs> of the year. I mean, really, folks, are you that vindictive? Are you that angry? Are you that mean that you would want to take Christmas away from somebody that they couldn't yeah. have their special food that they – behaved and looked forward to all year long really Mm -hmm. folks (laughs) and 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 so somebody named coleman what is his uh his name uh i gotta find i can't see his name offhand but uh this is appalling said coleman prison union chief oh i'm sorry so the coleman prison sorry the guy's name is joe rojas we're not getting paid and the inmates are eating steak the inmates know what's going on and they know about the shutdown and they're laughing at us (laughs) good grief man yeah this is some garbage (laughs) <laughs> it, it really is. The, 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 this is what's what gets people all fired up because yes, they're not getting paid, but they're going to get paid. 
Yeah, these I are going to be back pay people, right? I, I lived through enough of these. And even the people who have been furloughed who are not working, they are also going to get paid as if they had worked. Right. They. Th this is the way it always happens. Uh, Congress has to approve uh, back pay for the furlough and all that stuff, right? And I think that they've never not approved it. They have never not approved it, my recollection. So, Mr. Rojas, if you have not saved a few dollars, to be able to make it <laughs> through one payday without getting paid, then you have kind of failed as an individual. <laughs> well, it is now on the second week, I think. It's at 14 days today, isn't it? Right, but they, haven't missed, a, uh, they, haven't, missed a payday. they haven't missed a payday yet. They're coming, as I understand, they're coming up on a payday next week. Right. That this will be, the, be a payday. That's oh, a payday. yeah, with like, with like a, with a backfill, like you get paid a week behind when you did the work. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Sure. Uh, but But really... I mean, I'd yes. give you a little bit of slack if you're 17 years old and you haven't learned to budget and you haven't learned the value of money. But if you're an adult and you can't make it through one payday, I'm sorry to tell you, you've kind of failed as an individual. Yeah, that is pretty sad. And that I know we're going to get all kind of hate mail over that. <laughs> People are going to say that you don't understand. And, and yes, I do understand. I've lived on public assistance. I've lived in the in the uh, the uh, youth hostels and in the YMCA's when they had shelter. I understand. And I understand what you have to do. And what, here's what you have to do. Here's some pontification for you. You have to always strive to live on less than what you have coming in. Yep. Your goal should always be to complete a pay cycle and have money left over, even if it means giving up satellite, even if it <sighs> means giving up and going out and watching the uh, uh, Colorado Rockies play baseball, even if what? it means not having the very best of stuff, you would have to try to end each pay cycle with something left over. And you want those to grow cycle after cycle so that if you have to miss a, a pay cycle or two, you fall back on that. That's Hang what on. you should You're do. You're talking living below my means? That's not the American way, though. Well, I know it's not. I just heard today, I was listening to a financial program, 40% of the people in this country – uh, and I'm talking about adults. I'm, uh, we're taking out the young people that are, that are teenagers or just uh, uh, very young adults. But 40% of the mature individuals that have, that have lived their life, working their entire life, have less than $10,000 in total assets accumulated. 40% of Americans, if this was accurate, have accumulated less than $10,000. So you're saying, I think that would be approximately 80 million people. Uh, well, four times, no, it'd be more. We got 300 million people. So 40% yeah, of take. But you got to take away oh, a third yeah, of those for the you underage. Take, you got to take the kids out, yeah. So, so I call that a third. But 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 isn't that kind of sad that, <laughs> that you can go a whole lifetime and not accumulate ten thousand dollars? That's pretty sad. That is pretty sad. Well, so let's move on to what should kind of be happy news. Someone criticized that we need to provide some more good news. So here's a an a, a uh, Seventh Circuit opinion that actually goes in our favor, but it's pretty narrow. Seventh Circuit vacates conditions of supervised release following child pornography conviction. Larry, this is all you. This is so much legal propeller head stuff that I I can read the words and they, I can I can pronounce them all, but stringing them together makes slightly more than zero sense. Well, this is oh, when you say Seventh Circuit, I'll remind people we're Thank talking you. about we're talking about the federal judicial system. If you look at the hierarchy of federal courts, you have the Supreme Court at the top, that's nine justices, that's the highest tribunal, and then you have courts of appeals, and we have we have eleven circuits, and each state lives of uh, rests within one of those circuits. In your case, you're in the eleventh circuit. In my case, I'm in the tenth circuit, uh, and we also have the D.C. circuit. So there's effectively twelve circuits, and then we have the district courts, which are the trial court level. A person with a federal charge is going to be sentenced by a district judge in most cases. And then the federal system also has magistrate judges that do the preliminary matters on, 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 on cases before they're handled by the district judge. So what we have here is an appeal out of a district court in Illinois, which was taken to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, which is where the, that, that state resides, rested within the Seventh Circuit. The Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals would be one one rung beneath the Supreme Court, and this person was convicted in the federal system. And what's what's exciting about it is because we keep seeing these cases reinforcing what we've said on this podcast for so many times. Is can they do that? Yes, they can do it <laughs> until they're stopped. 
Right. This is a this is an individual who had a a a, a possession conviction from some number of years ago. I think it said two thousand seven uh, that he was originally convicted. Yeah, after pleading guilty two thousand seven to possessing digital images of child pornography in violation of the U.S. Code, he was sentenced to seventy eight months, which is what we were talking about earlier. That people get uh, five times twelve is sixty. They're required to get sixty months. He got seventy eight months of imprisonment and three years of supervised release. Which is what the federal system refers to as 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 post prison. You don't have parole; you have supervised release, and it's a form of probation, re entry, supervision. And he violated his supervised release, and and he didn't contest the conditions until they until he violated them, and and then uh, he was going he was going to have to spend more time in prison, and he filed an appeal, and the conditions that that, that he contested. The Court of Appeals said that 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 uh, they they were vacating two of those conditions that that, that was imposed. And the, uh, the first condition, uh, 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 people need to understand that 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 you can uh, conditions of supervision can be very very intrusive. They but they can't just be willy nilly applied. As a general matter, I'm going to read directly from the Seventh Circuit opinion. First, the condition must be reasonably related. To one, the defendant offense, history, characteristics. Two, the need for adequate deterrence. Three, the need to protect the public from further crimes of the defendant. And four, the need to provide the defendant with treatment. That's the general. general so can you, can you do a lot of things? Yes. But they have to, there has to be some specific tailoring. Such a condition cannot involve greater deprivation of liberty than is reasonably necessary to achieve the goal of deterrence, incapacitation, and rehabilitation. Last of the condition must be consistent with any relevant statements issued by the United States Sentencing Commission. Well, he had he had conditions that he felt were overly broad. He had a notification condition that he had to notify any individual of of his characteristics, and he his his, his violation was he he smoked dope, <laughs> which is which is pretty much a, a common condition of supervision. Right. Uh, he he looked at porn, adult porn. And he held a child without informing the the, the uh, parent of the child or the guardian that he was a, a, a convicted sex offender, and uh, it, it, so he contested those conditions he, that he had, which was blank, pretty much blanket a ban from from porn. That he had to notify anybody of of of, of what his uh, uh, what his conviction was, and that he couldn't use the internet for looking at porn. And the, the Court of Appeals said, sorry, you can't do all those. You can do one of those. You can do the Internet. They don't want him looking at Internet porn because they think that was reasonably related to to what yeah, he sure. was doing for his original conviction. But they said he could look at the, the, the inferences that, the, that he can look at regular magazine or other form, forms of porn because <laughs> that that enjoys Second Amendment protection. And right. even though you don't have First ooh, Amendment, not second, first. First uh, yeah, or first. Yeah, second Amendment. First, excuse me. I certainly didn't. <laughs> first Amendment. <laughs> second Amendment. I'm thinking about those gun freaks. I mean, excuse me, not gun freaks. <laughs> gun supporters. <laughs> oh, man. You're driving the listenership down to zero again. <laughs> so um, it has First Amendment protection. And, and although while you're under supervision and being punished, you have, you have diminished. Rights. You, the First Amendment doesn't go away. You have rights to worship. You have you you have so so the, the appellate court said that that they could not require him to give that broad notice to anybody, and that they could not totally ban him from looking at at, at stimuli. But they could uh, do the internet. Uh, he can't look. He can't look at his his stimuli online. Right. So it's a good. It's a short. Uh, as, as decisions go, it's relatively short. It's only seven pages, uh, and it's a good read. So we're going to provide it to people who want to read it, and I think it'll be very helpful. It'll be in the show people. notes. It would be very helpful for people to understand that that just because a condition is put on you doesn't mean they can do that lawfully. Right, they and can, as they, we say all the time, they can do it until they're told to stop. So here's a guy that told them to stop and got a judge to say, "No, you have to stop." And this is in Illinois, which is one of the tougher states. Well, and, and the, the, the I mean, all the, the circuits have moved to be more conservative, uh, but but this is a fairly, as I understand it, fairly conservative uh, circuit court of appeals. But uh, they they are, I mean, they haven't not been very kind to the registry challenges, the ones that have been made by the park ban re, uh, right. re, restriction, 
uh, and they've they've not been very sympathetic. But on this one, they they seem to come down squarely on the side of there's got to be narrow t- tailored. It's got to be specific, specific to that <laughs> uh, characteristics, and you can't just apply these willy nilly conditions without articulating. They've got to be clear on why they're doing this. And do you the, the, care the to? Do you care to speculate on on the the court coming down, you know, whether they're conservative or progressive as far as how they would view the narrow tailoring side of things? I don't I don't think so because I'm getting more and more surprises. I'm seeing I'm seeing conservative courts do things that, that like in the North Carolina case with the Meredith that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, uh, according to our North Carolina people, that's a pretty conservative judge. And and so it's they seem to be all over the map on this. Um, uh, uh, I'm tr- I'm trying to figure out how to word the way that I'm asking this question. So the the legislature established that the supervising people could make all these extra conditions. Um, where would the doctrine, if maybe that's the right word to use, where would the where would the guidance come that says that your supervising conditions have to be reasonably related to your crime? So here's a guy that looked at some internet porn. And so they came down and said, no, man, you can't give these people all these other conditions. Long established, have- long established case law in terms of okay. uh, how much, um, how much constitutional protections you have, because when you're, in the, when you're in society, the constitution, uh, even if you're, if you're, if you're being punished, the constitution doesn't totally go out the window. You, you surrender rights, but it's the courts that determine how many of those rights you surrender. And the courts have determined that you don't surrender your They've made it loud and clear. You don't surrender your right to be on social media. You don't surrender your right to, to be on the internet. You don't surrender your total First Amendment rights to go to church. To, to I mean, you, 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 so it's the courts that are drawing those delineations and telling lawmakers you can't go that far. But like I have seen of probation restrictions that say you can't drive a car by yourself. And I, how, what's that related to? Unless you were going to try and like pick up somebody in you know you know the shopping center, like that other article we covered about with the guy that uh, committed suicide eventually from the vigilantes. But so why can't you drive? I mean, how how is that related to a crime if you were in your house looking at porn? I've I've not seen that condition, but I've heard of it that, that you can't drive a car. Uh, <laughs> do you know anybody that has that condition anyway? I I may be able to point somebody out. Yes. So. Do they enforce the condition, or is it just there? It's just there, mm-hmm. and I can't, I can't figure out like how, how are you supposed to like? Hey, probation says come to the office, and you go, I can't drive alone. Hang on, let me go get my mom to ride in the car with me so I can go to my probation office. <laughs> That's just, it's just silly. I mean, some of the conditions, you know, given, given what we're talking about here of them being specifically tailored to your crime. So you have an internet related crime. Okay. You have to have some level of restriction monitoring, whatever against your internet use. But why do all of the other things come along? Like the park thing. Why would that be there? You were in the house, in your house, looking at the things you weren't in the park, trying to diddle a kid. So, okay. If you were in the park trying to diddle a kid, fine. You're banned from parks, but you should be able to go look at porn. (laughs) <laughs> should be able to look at porn. Well, <laughs> or at least at least the cam shows, right? Well, that's not porn. Di- <laughs> or dial the nine hundred numbers. <laughs> well, if they had them anymore, but I don't know why. I don't know why you don't understand cam shows is not porn. But <laughs> I get your argument. I just don't think that that's going to fly. I have a feeling that someone's going to throw a pie in your face if you try and do that. I've been watching cam shows for forty years now. Oh my god, dude! You did not need to express that. Of course, we haven't had that of capacity for forty years. So, how long have we had that capacity? Uh, well, you could have gone to a establishment and looked at something that would have been a cam show. I'm sure. Well, I, well, I was talking about online. The ones yes. people, they're, 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 now there's thousands upon thousands of people that are they're showing you their whole life on a cam show. You can watch um, it from. You probably don't. You probably don't know of a guy. I think it was called TED TV. A guy strapped like a camera to maybe his head, maybe it was a chest cam, and he just recorded everything twenty four hours a day, and people watched it incessantly. It was insane how popular it was. I've heard of such a thing. And uh, but is there anything else that you would like to cover on this particular thing? No, I think it's a. I think it's a good decision for people to read, and then and, and what people want to make some phone calls or email some questions, but. Uh, we're we're building a body of case law that says you just can't go crazy on on conditions of supervision, and, and it, it's a good thing. This level, this this 
opinion is binding within the Seventh Circuit. And then like also the then persuasive law. against the other ones. It is a persuasive authority, but it's binding in the Seventh Circuit. And uh, you you continue to build a body of case law that says that there are limits, and then those have to, attorneys have to have to enforce those limits when they when they exceed them. And that requires you, resources as well. Do you think you don't think that this would then get appealed to the Supreme Court? Do you? And it could, but I don't think the Supreme Court. I mean, they only take a fraction of what yeah. they're asked to take. So they get nine thousand petitions a year. They grant ninety. So right, take ten percent, one percent. Excuse me. <laughs> your, your odds are pretty low. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Interesting. Well, very good, sir. How can people find us? They have to search very carefully. Do they use maybe any specific keywords to find us? Well, I would say that they could use uh, uh, they could go to our uh, uh, registrymatters.co. They could find us that way. They could. They could. I was what I was trying to get at is they could search registry matters on the internets and you'll find us. Oh, you can. You can. So if I Google registry matters, I'll find us. Absolutely. Come on. Yeah. What if I Absolutely. use uh, what if I use Bing or some other search engine other than Google? Will I still find us? That's a good question. I don't ever use Bing, so I can't even answer that question. I, no one cares. Bing has like 20% of the internet traffic, so it, it is an irrelevant thing. But they should. Well, all right. How, so the, how, so you how do searching. people call and leave voicemail? Well, that is – now I've got that number down. I've memorized it. It's 747-227-4477, and it will be repeated if you hit replay. 747 <laughs> Two two seven four four seven seven. And where can people send us an email message? That would be registry matters cast at gmail.com. Outstanding. Um, and what is the best way to support the show and show the love? That would be to, to sign up for a one hundred dollar a month or better. I mean a dollar a month, excuse <laughs> me. <laughs> A dollar a month is actually the, uh, respectable, but any amount from a dollar up a month, you can go to uh, patreon.com. Is that the way you pronounce it? It is Patreon? not. It's totally Patreon. <laughs> Patreon.com slash registry. Uh, I did do a Bing search for registry matters and the entire first page, all but one link. for So uh, nine out of 10 links are pointed to us, whether you want to find us on Twitter, on uh yeah, actually, you know, you can go follow us on Twitter if you want to, or you can find us on TuneIn or Stitcher, YouTube, all the places. And one other thing, please, 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 if you can't support us, but even if you can support us, please go to wherever you get your podcast, whether that's iTunes, Stitcher, uh, Pocket Cast, Google Play, wherever, and leave us a five-star review. And that would be much appreciated and help people find the podcast because we've had a whole bunch of growth lately, and I'm not really sure where it came from <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> Sorry, I keep like halfway coughing and trying to 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 curb it back, and it doesn't come out very well. Well, well, well. If if you were under the uh, tutelage of Jim Uglum, who was one of my instructors back in the seventies, you would be got you would have gotten a lot of demerit for this for this week. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. I am sure. I keep trying to hit mute when it happens, but sometimes I miss. So, uh, and what's this about this Discord thing down here? What is this all about? All right. Well, Discord A is how we record the show because it has incredible audio quality. It, it sounds amazing and has made my life editing the podcast so much better. But then we also have what would be considered a registry batter server. And lately, a whole bunch of new people have signed in so we can talk. And as the conversations, as more people join, I'll start segmenting out rooms instead of just having general banter. But it seems to me, Larry, that our people need a place to talk to each other about their issues. And I don't want it to turn into a bitch session all day long, but to provide encouragement, anything like that. I don't know where else our people can go to have a forum to communicate with each other, with people that know about us. Does that make sense? I don't either. So come to discord, sign in. You can be completely anonymous. You don't have to leave an email address. You don't have to do anything. You can make some BS name. If you want to somebody's name, two plus two equals five. That is his name. I have no idea who he is. I know he's up in new, in new England somewhere. And uh, so, yeah, and I'm on it all day. Cause I have a whole bunch of other discord servers that I'm associated with, but I'm in there all day. I have it on my phone 
and I will know that you're talking. And if you want to ask a question, if you want to leave a story idea, anything like that, come hang out. Good times. Sounds good. Yep. I like it. And like I said, I mean, the sound quality for the podcast is amazing. I like it a lot. Do a phone. Let's do one on phone next week and then see if people can tell any difference. <laughs> yeah, we'll do the intro. I'll say I'll, it'll be, you know, recording live and it'll sound like it's in a little tin can and all shallow. Oh. Well, so with all that, press stop on the record. Thank you very much, Larry. I appreciate it very much. And I hope you have the great rest of your weekend. All right. Thanks.